Hello and good evening. You're watching Awani Tonight with me, Hafiz Marzuki. The country saw a total of 4,440 suicide cases in the past five years. Deputy Prime Minister Datuk Seri Ahmad Zahid Hamidi reveals that the number of suicides has spiked, particularly over the last three years, with over or close to 1,000 suicide cases each year since 2021. The majority of suicides, he added, involved men at over 3,600 cases, while the number of suicides by women was over 780. The Chinese community have continued to have the highest number of suicides yearly compared to other races since 2019. Non-Malaysian citizens had the second highest, while Indians and Malays both have third and fourth highest number of suicides every year respectively. According to Zahid, the country is experiencing a drastic social and economic change due to demographic changes, urbanisation, economic inequality, hyperconnectivity, among others. He urged for drastic change in social policy approach to keep up. From October 2022 to June 2024, the National Mental Health Crisis Line 15555 received over 48,900 calls. The government is mulling to give allowances to SPM students and teachers in an effort to boost interest. Deputy Education Minister Wong Ka Wo says this is in line with the Form 6 Education Development Plan 2024 to 2030 released in May. Among the four initiatives under the ministry's efforts to attract interest of students and raise the morale of teachers include studying setting higher per capita grants rate for STPM subjects. Wong said the government is also studying the possibility of giving a cost of living allowance to students and senior assistant teachers in Form 6. However, he said the plan is still in its initial stages. In July last year, Education Minister Fadrina Side said the government is planning to rebrand the Form 6 colleges to the Ministry of Education Pre-University Colleges. She said the move will give it a new image. Banks are responsible for conducting detailed investigations into unauthorised banking transactions and cannot shift the burden onto victims of scams, says Deputy Finance Minister Lim Hui Ying. Speaking in the Dewan Rakyat, she emphasises that banks must bear losses in cases of fraud unless the security was compromised by the account holder's own negligence. Beban untuk melakukan penyiasatan terperinci untuk membuktikan kesalahan kepada transaksi perbankan tanpa kebenaran adalah terletak ke atas pihak bank dan bukan kepada mangsa scam. Mangsa scam memang tidak perlu buktikan yang itu transaksi uh, tidak uh, benar tetapi adalah bank untuk membuktikan. She was responding to Stumpin MP Chong Chien Jen who asked for a legislation update so banks can be made accountable for the rising number of scam cases. She added Bandagara Malaysia recently enhanced the policies regarding unauthorized electronic banking transactions. This includes ensuring financial institutions conduct more thorough and transparent investigations within a reasonable time frame, as well as implementing more effective prevention controls such as a kill switch for customers to freeze their accounts. Malaysia's participation in BRICS will not be in conflict with its foreign policy. Prime Minister Datuk Seri Anwar Ibrahim says that it is important to establish relations with all parties, adding that the priority is trade. Mengapa kita harus terikat dengan satu blok? Now, sekarang ini bila dah ada satu perkembangan, ada blok baru yang akan memberikan saingan dan juga bidang kerjasama, kita juga terus menjalin hubungan dengan kedua-dua atau kalau boleh ketiga, keempat. Dan sebab itu saya katakan, Bila Indonesia dan Thailand memaklumkan minat dan malah mereka telah bersama memohon untuk OECD, kita pun mengambil sikap dan pendekatan sama. Anwar also said Malaysia's good relations with the member countries of BRICS, consisting of Brazil, Russia, India, China and South Africa, will enable Malaysia to become a partner country with the trade grouping soon. The Prime Minister first announced Malaysia's intention to join BRICS in June. We'll go for a short break. Stay with us.
Welcome back. As the UK moves to the centre-left with its new Labour government, most of Europe, apart from France's unexpected shift to the left, is leaning more towards the hard right. Karisma Putra Abdul Rahman from Bait Al Amanah discusses this difference in political direction. In the EU, there is much more proportional representation, meaning these far-right politicians have a greater voice and platform in their respective countries. And it's not, in my opinion, it's not that the UK is necessarily diverging from the EU trend. It's just that its political system doesn't allow for proportional representation. And so overall, the UK shift to the left actually highlights that UK voters for now still reject the right and far right movements. Although parties like Reform UK have performed decently in terms of the popular vote, the first past the post system, of course, suppresses their ability to have a platform to strengthen their views. And because of this, the Labour government is in a much safer position and may actually serve as a motivator for more centrist and left-wing European Parliament political groups to mount a stronger challenge against the right and far-right type. So the recent European Parliament elections conducted this year show that the far-right wing, hard and Eurosceptic identity and democracy group lost 19 seats in favour of the more moderate right wing, but still Eurosceptic European conservatives and reformist group. So instead, I propose that we can observe a slight convergence actually between the latest EU Parliament election and the UK election towards the centre. It is, of course, not to say that there is no ideological gap. There is very much an ideological gap here. But there is forces, the, for, the political forces are somewhat converging towards a more... Um, central position overall. However, this, of course, only represents the European Parliament and does not represent the lawmakers within individual EU countries. The future looks messy without an internationally agreed upon framework for artificial intelligence governance, says Singapore's Minister for Communication and Information, Josephine Teo. She also said that Singapore was more excited than worried about AI but added there's a need to implement specific laws to deal with deep fakes during elections. She said this during an interview at the Reuters Next Conference in Singapore. Josephine has previously indicated the need for novel approaches to get the most out of AI innovations while managing the downside risks. She used AI Verify, a Singaporean homegrown testing framework and software toolkit, as an example of this. According to her, AI is a strategic national priority because of the adjustments it will demand of the people and businesses. With the risks of job displacements and business disruptions, she had said that the Singaporean government is determined to ensure there are support measures in place. Amid escalating tensions over the Israel-Gaza war, Australia has appointed a special envoy to combat anti-Semitism and uphold social cohesion. Prime Minister Anthony Albanese announces that lawyer Gillian Seagal will consult with community leaders and discrimination experts to advise the government. Albanese said Seagal's appointment, given her leadership roles in education, banking sectors and the Jewish community, was crucial to easing tensions. He added that a special envoy to address Islamophobia would also be appointed soon. The ongoing conflict in the Middle East has sparked protests from both Jewish and Muslim communities in Australia. The country supports a two-state solution and expressed increasing concerns about Israel's operations in Gaza. Australia's decision to appoint a special envoy follows that of the US, UK, Canada and Greece, all of which had similar positions for years. While it was welcomed by the National Peak Body for the Australian Jewish Community, Concerns were raised by others, such as the Jewish Council of Australia and the Australian-Palestine Advocacy Network, who fear it could deepen divisions. The White House has pushed back on questions about Joe Biden's mental fitness after a New York Times report revealed a Parkinson's disease specialist visited the White House eight times from August to March. Concerns that the US president's health have increased following his frail appearance during last month's debate against Republican Donald Trump. 
has it, been evaluated? Oh, well, I can tell you this. Just going back to Parkinson's for a little bit, so to give you some answers here, has the president been treated for Parkinson's? No. Is he being treated for Parkinson's? No, he's not. Is he taking medication for Parkinson's? No. So those are the things that I can give you full-blown answers on, but I'm not going to do. I'm not going to confirm a specialist, a, any specialist that comes to come to, comes well, to the White House out of privacy. Question. Dr. Kevin O'Connor, the White House doctor, also issued a letter on Monday night that said Biden has not seen a neurologist outside of his normal annual medical checkup. Biden has made it clear he would not step aside from the presidential race despite criticism from some Democrats that he lacks the mental equity to stand as the nominee against Trump in the November 5th presidential election. At least 41 people were killed and dozens wounded after Ukraine was hit by a barrage of missile strikes across the country. The strikes had also hit Ukraine's largest children's hospital in Kiev, as rescuers combed through the wreckage for survivors. President Volodymyr Zelensky said Russia fired more than 40 missiles, targeting different cities and damaging infrastructure, commercial and residential buildings. Meanwhile, Ukrainian authorities said a Russian missile struck the hospital not far from central Kiev. However, the Kremlin said it was a Ukrainian anti-missile fire that struck the hospital. Kremlin spokesman Dmitry Peshkov did not provide evidence to support the assertion, but insists that Russia does not conduct strikes on civilian targets. The Ukrainian health ministry said five units of the children's hospital, the largest and best equipped in the country, were damaged and children were evacuated to other facilities. Six people have died in Tokyo due to heat stroke. Japanese authorities issued warning alerts urging residents to avoid going outside unless absolutely necessary. Over the weekend, Shizuoka became the first region in Japan to reach 40 degrees Celsius this year, far exceeding the 35 degree threshold classified by weather officials as extremely hot. Hot and humid summers are typical in Japan, especially after the rainy season ends in mid to late July. However, experts say temperatures have been particularly high in recent years due to global heating and other climatic factors. There is growing concern for the country's large elderly population who are more vulnerable to heat stroke. The Fire and Disaster Management Agency reported that more than half of the 2,276 people taken to hospital for heat stroke in the last week of June were aged over 65. That wraps up this edition of Awani Tonight. I'm Hafiz Marzuki. Thanks for watching and good night.